today with us is uh, Roberto Trotta with his book, uh, The Edge of the Sky. It's going to be an interesting cosmology talk for those of you who would like to learn more about cosmology, but in simple words. So let me just give a brief introduction. Roberto Trotta is a theoretical cosmologist in the Astrophysics Group of the Imperial College in London. He has held research positions at the University of Geneva and the University of Oxford, as well as visiting positions at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cape Town, the Institute of the Astrophysique de Paris, and the University of California at Santa Barbara. One of the world's leading figures in astrostatistics, a new discipline focusing on the use of statistical methods to solve problems in cosmology and astrophysics. He has published more than 50 scientific papers, contributed to two books, and received numerous awards for his research, including the Michelson Prize of Case Western Reserve University, the Lord Kelvin Award of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, and a public engagement fellowship by the Science and Technology Facilities Council in the UK. Please uh, join me in welcoming Roberta to Google. Thank you, Boris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here today. I'm very pleased to be here today in such an amazing place, full of computer people who can search the entire worldwide computer to answer all of your questions um, and can draw a picture of the streets in the entire home world. And now, so I hear, you're even building cars that can drive alone. So this is really the perfect place for me to talk about my new book, The Edge of the Sky. This book came out of a straightforward, simple idea, that it should be possible to talk about very hard things in a straightforward way that all people can understand. The problem with student people like myself, you see, is that sometimes we get carried away and speak about our work using words in a tongue that only other student people can understand. This makes it not possible to have a conversation uh, with other people, people like you. After a little while, your eyes would be, begin to stare into empty space, and you probably walk away as soon as you can with a silent sigh, happy to have escaped. A way to avoid all that is uh, by talking with only the most used 10 hundred words in this tongue. When I heard about this, I thought that it could be fun to use it to explain the old there is. And this is what my book is about and what this uh, day here is about. I'd like to share with you some of the ideas behind the book and the story of how this slightly crazy idea became reality. So you might have thought that this was a little strange, perhaps, and you might have thought, well, this is down to the fact that I spent way too much time uh, in Britain, and so uh, of course we know that the United States and, and, and Britain are two nations which are separated by the same language. But actually, that's not the reason why this sounded a little bit weird. And the reason why this was different is because this was written using only the most common 10 hundred words in English, which is the idea behind uh, the edge of the sky. And so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense for what this language is about and how it actually can change the way we communicate with each other. So before I go on, I'd like to uh, ask you to keep your phones on in case you switch them off. I hope not. And uh, please join the conversation on Twitter uh, by getting in touch with me uh, with my Twitter handle and the edge of the sky hashtag. So let me take a step back and go back to the 60s and where uh, at a time when very little was known about the universe and we didn't have all of the great data and the great capabilities to observe the sky and the universe as we do today. This Two gentlemen came up with a wonderful discovery in 1965. Pensiles and Wilson, they were working at the Bell Labs uh, in, in New Jersey, uh, not far away from Princeton, in fact. And they had a big microwave antenna with which they were looking uh, into doing some experiments in the microwave communication. Early days still, before satellite communication, were trying to bounce off some microwaves of some passing passive satellites, trying to communicate uh, long distance using microwaves. Uh, but the problem was that they couldn't make their antenna work because they kept um, picking up a very strange background noise, a noise that they didn't know where it was coming from, and they tried very, very hard to get rid of that noise, and they couldn't. At some point, then, they uh, got in touch with uh, a team of scientists at Princeton who were actually trying to build an antenna to look for this kind of noise. And this microwave noise, this microwave light, 
was none, the, none other than the uh, light echo from the Big Bang itself. Unbeknown to them, they had discovered the relic radiation from the Big Bang. And so in 1965, they came out with this paper here, a paper that in only one and a half pages talks about this momentous discovery. And the title of the paper is A Measurement of Excess Antenna Temperature at 4080 Megacycles per Second. And that's not a great title, to be fair. Right? I mean, what they were trying to do is to say is we have found evidence that the universe had a beginning. This is, we discover the luminous echo from the Big Bang. But this title is kind of jargony and not really accessible to anybody, but especially and even them, to be fair, they didn't actually know what they, were, they had discovered. It was the Princeton team that told them what, what, what their discovery meant. And so in terms of communicating the science, it, scientific papers are perhaps not the best way of getting the message across. So you might think 1965 was early days still in, in science and astrophysics and certainly science communication wasn't as developed as it is today. And so things must have improved in the meantime. So let's have a look at another momentous discovery in my field in astrophysics, uh, a discovery that was worthy of the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2011. And uh, here's a, a paper, 1999, published in, in the Astrophysical Journal with a, a title that goes as follows, Measurements of Omega and Lambda from 42 High Redshift Supernovae. Now, wherever you see Greek letters in, in scientific papers and, and specific astrophysical papers, that's a sign that we, the scientists, are trying to be clever and smart and trying to um, make it look like as if we know a lot about what we're talking about, but we don't necessarily. Okay? And so the paper goes on, the abstract says, we report measurement of the mass density omega matter and cosmological constant energy density omega lambda of the universe based on the analysis of 42 type 1a supernovae discovered by the Supernova Cosmology Project, et cetera, et cetera. And then it goes on and on and on. And so what they're trying to say with this paper is, we have discovered evidence that the universe is expanding in an accelerated way and is being ripped apart by an unknown force that we call dark energy. And yet none of that really comes through if you read the paper or uh, the abstract or indeed the title. So that was 1999. You might think, well, actually, OK, let, nowadays, 21st century, uh, with all the social media and so on, uh, communicating uh, exciting science must, must be, have become so much easier. So let's have a look at another discovery, another Nobel Prize for physics, this time at the Large Hadron Collider, the particle accelerator at CERN, Geneva. And here the title is Observation of a New Boson at a Mass of 125 GV with a CMS Experiment at the LHC. Now, you can see now that there is no longer a list of authors. There is only uh, a CMS collaboration uh, tag as a list of authors. That's because science has become so big in the meantime, two people for the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1965, the discoverers of the microwave background, about 25 or 30 people on the previous paper for the supernova type 1a dark energy discovery. And now the CMS collaboration, about 5,000 scientists working on this big project. So that's how big science is nowadays. And how do they present this result? Well, they say results are presented. OK, now we go over to the passive form to make it look at even more sort of impersonal and objective. Results are presented from searches for the standard model Higgs boson proton proton collision at square root of S equals 7 and 8 TeV in the compact muon solenoid. A compact muon solenoid is, is a euphemism. Of course, a compact muon solenoid is like a five story high building full of instrumented iron and other, and other computerized uh, detectors. So that's what compact means nowadays in physics. So the compact muon solenoid experiment at the LHC using data samples corresponding to integrated luminosities of up to 5.1 inverse femtoband at 7 TV and 5.3 inverse phantom at 8 TV, et cetera, et cetera. And so what are they trying to say? They're trying to tell us that they've discovered the, the God particle, the Higgs boson, the particle that, that, that gives mass to all of the particles. And so you can see that uh, scientific research papers are not perhaps the very best places to look for the excitement that all this great science actually uh, is about and the great discoveries that this science is, is supposed to be communicating to the public as well. And you know, fair enough, those are scientific papers which are written for specialists, by specialists, and they're targeting a very restricted audience. But as a scientist working in this field, my quest has been for many years now to find ways of talking about these very exciting science topics in a more accessible, direct, and exciting ways to communicate with, with the public and, and, and the educated public and people who are interested in these discoveries in a, in a more effective way and try to find ways of not only talking about the science that those great discoveries uh, are about, but also about having a dialogue with people, breaking down the communication barriers, the jargon, such as those examples that we just saw, uh, is, is, is raising in, in, in our discussion between, between us, ourselves and, and the public, and the, the scientists and the public.
So my work in astrophysics and, and cosmology is about uh, this, um, using big data and astrostatistical, that's to say advanced statistical methods to analyze those big data and trying to understand them in terms of what they mean for the fundamental nature and fundamental theories of our universe. So big questions such as dark, what is the nature of dark energy, dark matter, stuff that we don't know in the universe that's dark and invisible and yet is responsible for 95% of the universe. What, where does the universe come from? What will be its final fate? So all of those questions are hugely exciting to us, the scientists, but also to the public at large. How do we talk about those discoveries in a way that's more meaningful and more interactive and not uh, full of jargon? So for a decade now, I've been looking for different ways of communicating this exciting science with the public, and I tried different things. I tried uh, using food to talk about cosmology. So explaining the Hubble expansion, the expansion of the universe in terms of, uh, of uh, pizza dough, for example, where you here you see an example of uh, you know, our galaxy, the Milky Way here, and a model of the universe expanding here with other galaxies, the other bits of olives, expanding out as time goes on in this, in this sense. You can see the universe expands and all galaxies move away from every other galaxy. And that's a perfect 2D model of the universe, uh, which you, know, you can make in, in your own kitchen. And it works fairly well. You can see here this little yardstick, which is made of a piece of beam, bean, I think. And you can see that you know, distances grow between galaxies. Here is, you know, it's one uh, bean unit, one and a half, two <laughs> bean units. It works. So, so that, that's a funny way of engaging uh, with the public because it's, you know, it's hands-on. It's stuff that you can do in your own kitchen. Then I've, I've taken it to the next stage, and I've tried uh, putting on a cosmic cookery show. <laughs> And uh, you know, I'm, I'm cooking pancakes and, and with a live audience. And uh, because this is in the UK, where um, uh, safety, health and safety laws are very strict, you can see I, I even have a little uh, extinctor here, a fire extinguisher at hand, just in case things go wrong, as they do. You know, when you do you experiment with a microwave and then burn chocolate in the microwave, there's lots of smoke coming out. It's very spectacular, and it, it's it's fun. It, it's a way of engaging the public in, as well in, in a way that's uh, a little bit different. I work with artists and designers to, to build artwork that is um, um, inspired by cosmological ideas. Here is, for example, a, a, a structure, a, a creation that um, conceptualizes redshift in a, in a slightly different way. And I work with architects and others to create things like this pinball machine that was uh, exhibited at the Venice Biennale a few years ago that represented some sort of potential energy um, idea. It would be a long story, probably a story for another talk. But the point is that I've tried different avenues, but I was looking always for something that was a little different. I was looking for something that was more immediate and creative in a way that would involve language as well. And perhaps all along, I had in the back of my mind this um, great exa example that goes back to Ernest Hemingway, apparently. It's, I don't know whether this story is true, but it's uh, attributed to him. And the story is that Hemingway was one day sitting around the table with some friends, and those friends challenged him to uh, construct a, a novel in a very short number of words, just perhaps six words. And he said, yes, of course, I can do it. And a bet was, was made, and, and he accepted the bet. And then he sat there for a few minutes, and he thought about it, and he came up with uh, what is now be become known as a form of um, flash fiction. And the, the novel that he wrote in only six words is this. For sale, baby shoes never worn. So it's quite intense. Six words only. There's an entire word behind these six words. And, and there's lots that, that remains unsaid, but there's, there's lots that stimulates, perhaps, your imagination. There's more to the just the words. There is another layer, and, and you, uh, or us, as, as the readers, are stimulated at, uh, to, to think what, what, what else is the story going, beyond, beyond, going on beyond those words and behind those words. And so I was looking for something like that, some way of condensing all we know about the universe, the all there is, in a simple, yet imaginative and creative way. Now, of course, in physics, if we think about physics and science in general, we have ways of condensing a variety of phenomena down in very simple terms. So for example, if we think about electricity and magnetism, uh, those are phenomena that are ubiquitous in our everyday lives, from power generation to any sorts of electrical tools in our households to electricity and light and telecommunication. Um, and, and, and power, again, turbine generation here, all of those things are aspects of 
uh, the electrical and magnetic phenomena that very much rule our lives, or certainly have a big part in our lives. And yet all of this, all of this variety of phenomena are down to one single uh, force, the electromagnetic force, which can be described in physics uh, using a, a very condensed, a very s simple, in a sense, expression, a mathematical description, which uh, uh, boils down to this one equation here. Now, I won't unpack this one equation for you necessarily, but I just want to, 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 to highlight how physics in general is a quest for simplicity, a quest for beauty, a quest for symmetry. All of those things are condensed into equations such as this one, which is a, a compact form of writing down the four Maxwell equations that, as you might remember from, uh, from high school or university, if uh, you encountered those before, the four Maxwell equations describe all of the electromagnetic phenomena that we know about. And they can all be written down in one simple line, in one single equation, this equation here. But the problem, of course, with this, is with this language, it takes, uh, you know, in this form, it will take uh, probably a major in physics to understand what this form means. Uh, it, it is not a, a, a way of presenting electromagnets that we use even for our undergraduate physics students. And so, while there is beauty, simplicity, symmetry, elegance even in an equation such as this, this is not something that we can use to communicate with the public because of this not only language barrier, but also technical knowledge gap. So we need to go beyond this and find ways of unpacking the beauty and elegance of, this, of equations such as this in a way that's more immediate, more, under, more understandable. Here's another example. The universe with all its plethora of phenomena from uh, uh, galaxies such as uh, the Andromeda galaxy, our neighbor galaxy, or uh, binary stars that uh, uh, eat up each other and then explode in a big explosion at the end of their life, to the distribution of clusters in the sky and the dark matter structures, perhaps, as well in the universe. All of this is gov largely governed by gravity. And gravity, as Einstein told us in 1915 with the discovery of the general theory of relativity, can be written down, all of this can be written down in one simple elegant equation, which is this Einstein uh, equation. It's a beautiful equation, again, very elegant, very dense, very, uh, 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 very compact in a sense. And this equation is telling us on this side here that the, sp the shape space-time, which is described by this symbol here, is, is, is equal to the uh, uh, matter energy content on that side here. And so what this equation says in words is that um, space-time is, uh, is bent by the presence of mass, and, there, and mass reacts to the shape of space-time in its movement through, through space. And so for example, what this equation tells us is that gravity is not a force like Newton thought and like we learned in school. Gravity is a consequence of the geometry of space-time. And so when we see the moon going around the Earth in a circular orbit, or so, so we think, um, it's not a force that's keeping this, this, this uh, uh, satellite on track. What's happening is the mass of the Earth is changing the shape of space-time around it. And therefore, the moon is going in a straight path. Only a straight path in a bent space-time looks like a circle. And this is all beautifully uh, condensed into this one equation. And so I was looking for ways of expressing all of that in a way that would be understandable to, to, to people who have not studied physics but are no, nonetheless fascinated and interested by all of these phenomena. After all, the cosmos is perhaps one of the biggest questions that uh, are in science, uh, questions such as where does the universe come from? What will the destiny of the universe be? What is the fundamental nature of reality? These are questions that concern us all at some very high level. But nonetheless, those are questions that fascinate uh, the public at large. So how do we talk about them in a, in a, in a more immediate way? So I was thinking about all, all those, those things, and I've been thinking about all of them for, for a long time now. And then one day, I came across something that was uh, really interesting and inspirational. I came across the AppGoer 5. Now, I probably don't need to explain to this audience, audience what XKCD is. But in case you are uh, a new Google employee that just landed from Mars and haven't heard of XKCD before, I'll just say a few words about it. XKCD is this uh, widely popular, geeky, frankly geeky, uh, cartoon on the web, which is uh, characterized by a, a, a very, uh, a very peculiar sense of humor. Uh, you know, sometimes those cartoons are about um, physics, 
and I get some of those. So often they're about computer science, and I don't get many of those, I must admit. And, and sometimes they're very funny, and sometimes they're just you know, uh, are targeted at specific, uh, at specific communities, and so you don't necessarily get them all. But Randall Monroe, the creator of XKCD, one, uh, a year and a half ago or so, came up with this idea of the Apgoer 5. As you can see, the Apgoer 5 is, is none other than the Saturn V moon, moon rocket, with, the, with one difference, with one twist. The twist was that Randall thought of labeling this picture of the Saturn V with uh, labeling all, of, all the parts with only the most used 1,000 words in, in English language. And so, uh, of course, you couldn't call it the Saturn V moon rocket, because the moon is not one of the thousand words, and rocket is not one of the thousand words, and Saturn is not one of the thousand words. So he named it the Apgoer 5. And instead of calling it a, a NASA's Apgoer 5, he, he called it US Space Team's Apgoer 5. And it's, it's funny, if you go through the various parts, there are, there are uh, bits and pieces that read like, uh, for example, here, the escape module. It's, it's called the thing to help people escape really fast if there is a problem, and everything is on fire, so they decide not to go to space. Which is a fair, it's a good description, isn't it? And uh, if you go down, down here, there's the oxygen tank, cold air for burning and breathing. This part had a very big problem once through that. And then here, the, 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 the lunar module is the part that flies down to the other world with two people inside, and so on and so forth. So it was a fun and interesting idea, and people picked it up on the internet. And so some people um, put together a web page where uh, they challenged users of that web page to write up their job description using this thousand words format. And so I tried that, and one day I came across it, and, and I tried that, I spent half an hour trying to write up, write up my, my, uh, my job as an astrophysicist. And it was very hard, much harder than you would imagine, uh, because many, many of the words that you like to use are not on the list. And it was quite surprising to go through the list and see which words are on it and which aren't. And so I, I wrote up that, that piece, maybe a couple of paragraphs, took me uh, maybe the best part of an hour to do so. I put it on my website, and then I kind of forgot about it. And then a few weeks later, I was giving a talk at the White Building in East London, which is an art venue near the Olympic Park. And the person who introduced me said uh, a few words about myself, and then they said that I, I also um, had written my job up using the thousand most used words, and they left it at that, and then I gave my talk, and then at the end, during the, the uh, Q&A session with the audience, somebody asked a question about what was this business with a thousand words, so I didn't understand what this thing is about, can you explain? And so because I had it on my computer, I read it aloud to, to the audience. And I read out what, what I'd written uh, in, in this format, and, and this was uh, what I had. I studied tiny bits of matter that are all around us, but we cannot see which we call dark matter. We know dark matter is out there because it changes the way other big, faraway things move, such as stars and star crowds. We want to understand what dark matter is made of because it could tell us about where everything around us came from and what will happen next. To study dark matter, people like me use big things that have taken lots of money, thought, and people to build. Some of those things fly way above us. Some are deep inside the ground. Some are large rings that make tiny pieces of normal matter kiss each other as they fly around very, very fast, almost as fast as light. We hope that we can hear the whisper of dark matter if we listen very carefully. We take all the whispers from all the listening things and we put them together in our computers. We use big computers to do this, as there are lots and lots of tiny whispers we need to look at. I go to places all over the world to talk to other people like me, as together we can think better and work faster. Together, perhaps, we can even find new, better ways to listen to dark matter. Most of them are good people, and after we talked, we go out and have a drink and talk some more. So I read this aloud, and I was astonished by the reaction uh, of the public, because uh, everybody was kind of taken aback by this format. They weren't expecting it to be quite like that, and so I got a very uh, warm round of applause, which was actually much better than the applause that I got for my talk. So I was, I was, I was encouraged by it, because I thought, well, actually, there is something. Perhaps this format is just what I was looking for. Perhaps in these thousand words, there is something hidden, and it would be an interesting and fun challenge to try to describe the entirety of all there is. Of course, the universe is not on the list, so the universe became the all there is, with this format here. And so that's what I started doing. I started sitting down, and I, and I tried to see whether this format could be expanded beyond three paragraphs to book length. And again, I was very lucky, because a few months after that, in April, I had uh, time to spend 
here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And that is the view out of my office window. So the edge of the sky, the title of the book probably um, came out of this moment here that I, I was so lucky to have a research stay, uh, a three months long research stay, uh, stay at Santa Barbara. And so I had the time and intellectual freedom to do research, of course, but also to devote myself a little bit to exploring this format and to explore the thousand words idea and to see whether it could be stretched to encompass the all there is. And so all of a sudden, I find myself battling against this self-imposed lexicon, this straight jacket. Uh, there were many, many words that I would have liked to use to describe the universe, which I didn't have. And so I started banging my head against it. I wanted to explain the entire history and entire knowledge of the universe, but without using the word universe, without using the word gravity, or telescope, or particle, or Earth. Planet was not on the list. Energy, so there wasn't even energy. Cosmos, of course not. Big Bang wasn't on the list. Galaxy, scientist. I couldn't talk about science nor scientists. No, not, not, not the, nor the moon was on the list. And not even fog was on the list, which is an important word if, you know, for people who live in the Bay Area. They talk about fog all the time. And, and you think, why, why do I need fog to describe the universe? Well, it turns out that the early universe can be described as a, as a sort of fog, high energy fog. But I couldn't use energy. I couldn't use fog. I could use high, but that's not, not very good, right? So what I needed to do was to try and invent a new sort of vocabulary, really, to be talking about all the reads with a, a very different set of words. And little by little, a new voice came together, a voice that sort of came out of the challenge itself. And the book has its own voice that is, was a co-creation between what I wanted to say and what the lexicon, the thousand word list, allowed me to say. And so a telescope became a big seer. The universe became the old rays, and planets became crazy stars because they go around in the projected motion on the sky, the apparent motion of the sky is, is back and forth, and so it's a crazy star. It doesn't go around like all other stars. <coughs> Particles became drops. Our planet, the Earth, became our home world, and scientists are student, uh, student people or student person in, in the book. Uh, the moon is the sun's sister. Sun is in the list, so I could use that. And galaxies are star crowds. Now, the Big Bang was, was easy, I thought, because, well, I can't use uh, a bang, but I can use flash. So I can, I can, I can and it was, a, it was a hot beginning, so I'll, I'll call it the hot flash. But then my editor told me that the hot flash was not a good word to use for that. And so, <laughs> and so I changed it to big flash, so I learned something. And so out of this new vocabulary, a new voice emerged, a new way of looking at the universe emerged, and here, at the end of the, at the, end of the, uh, the book, here's the, the, the word cloud of words that I ended up using, 707 words all together. And you can see that there's lots of dark, because there's lots of dark stuff in the book, dark energy, dark matter. Of course, dark energy is not called that. It's called the dark push. People, those are mostly student people, that's to say scientists, drops for particle. Away, far away is, is big because there's lots of far away things. Matter, light, space, crazy for crazy stars, seer for big seer, and so on. And so really, it becomes a different language. It's almost like creating a new language to talk about those things. So uh, today what I want to do, I want to share some of the voice, some of the bits of, of the voice that came out of this, and also share some of the science that's behind it. But before I do so, I wanted to give you uh, a, a little condensed version of the book. Uh, each of the 10 chapters of the book begins with a short, very short haiku style, three-liner form of poetry. So haiku is this uh, uh, Japanese form of poetry, which is uh, condensed in just three verses, which is often very uh, imagery, imagery heavy and very, very condensed. And so it's just a flash of, of words that tries to evoke something. And so I tried to condense each chapter down to just three lines. And so there are, there's 10 chapters, and so in 85 words, think of this as the pseudocode to the book, if you like. So that's a double condensed version of the universe. So the, the book contains 707 words, but actually here is the entire history of the universe in 85 words in this double condensed form. In the clear night, her dark hair mirrors the stars, blue words going around points of light. Behind the stars, space-time grows silent. Hot kisses leave light very tired. Her pink lips stay dry in the heavy dark rain. A soft song might tell you dark stories. With their last breath, a blushing of light from faraway stars. A silent end, times of light, half remembered. 
so many words, all that can be is. Everything opens at the smallest touch of a rose. So that's the entire picture of the order is the entire contents of the book boiled down to 85 words. It might be a little bit too dense. <laughs> so let me unpack it for you and, and, and step back and just tell you a little bit the, the storyline of the books. Because the, the book story came out as a, as a condensation, really, as a, as a distillation of hundreds of talks that I've given before, public talks that I've given to all sorts of people and, and, and in different settings. And so the story was, came very naturally to me. I was very uh, lucky that I had already in mind when I started writing the book what I wanted to, the story that I wanted to tell. And it's a story that begins with uh, uh, a student woman, a fictional character, here she is, walking up to Big Seer. There are two characters, really, in this book. One is the student woman, who is a student person, who goes out for the first time to one of the biggest telescopes on Earth, Big Seer, to, for a night of observation to study dark matter and try to crack the dark matter mystery. And so here she is walking up to Big Seer in this uh, beautiful illustration uh, that, uh, that accompanies the book. I was very lucky to have Antoine Depré, a very talented young uh, um, artist and illustrator who uh, produced and created the beautiful line drawings that, that, that accompany the book. And so our student person, she goes up to, the, to Big Seer. Big Seer is the second character in this book, is the silent helper, is the big telescope that helps her in trying to unlock the mysteries of dark matter. So it's a slightly fictionalized version of reality. Of course, in reality, um, scientists do not go out to telescopes at the top of mountains like Hawaii, for example, working alone at 12,000 feet, because that wouldn't be possible. But still, that's, that's a, 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 a fictional version of reality that, uh, f um, that allows us to follow her night of observation and her questions about the older is, the way it became to be what it is today, and all the questions that we still have about its, uh, its nature and its properties. She, in particular, is out there looking for dark matter, which is one of the biggest mysteries today, and one that can be probably solved by science in the next five years or so, or so we hope. So our, our scientist goes out and makes observations of the sky. And what is, is she looking for? Let's take a step back. Here is a picture of Edwin Hubble, 1927, the discoverer of what is now called Hubble's law. The fact that the universe is expanding, which Hubble um, discovered by looking at distant uh, star crowds that's to say galaxies. At the time, they were called nebulae. People didn't know what they were. They didn't even know whether they were inside or outside the white road, that's to say the Milky Way, our own galaxy. But what Hubble discovered was that uh, he, he charted out the, 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 the velocity of those distant star crowds as a function of their distance from us. And so each one of those dots is a measurement that he took, working not far away from here, uh, uh, in, this, in Southern California. And what he saw, he, he realized that as objects are further away from us here, they're also traveling at faster speeds and they're receding from us. They're moving away from us. And what he did, he very boldly drew a line through those points and said, here, there is a, a linear relationship. There is a relationship between how far away objects are and how far they're moving. And, it, and this and the slope of this line here, the slope of this relationship is to this day called Hubble's law. And this Hubble law is telling us that uh, far away galaxies is, are moving away from us faster than nearby galaxies. And this is only possible if the entire universe is expanding. In other words, the picture that emerged from this discovery is that galaxies are moving away from each other and they're moving away faster the further away they are because as a consequence of the fact that space-time itself between galaxies is stretching, is expanding, just like the pizza dough that we saw before. But the astonishing thing is that if we now turn this thing upside down and we look at time going backwards, in the backwards direction, if, things, if galaxies are moving away from each other today, it, this means that they were together in the, in the past, they were, they were closer by in the past. And if we go even back further back in the past, they were closer together. And if we can go even further back in time, there comes a point where all these, these galaxies were heaped up on top of each other which is what we call the Big Bang. So the astonishing discovery that Hubble made almost 100 years ago now was that the universe is expanding, and it, and it all came from an initial hot, dense point that we now call the Big Bang. And so this was what Hubble discovered with only a handful of observations, maybe 30, 40 galaxies he measured. That's all. But nowadays, of course, our discipline has moved on 
very much. And so we are very much entering the world of big data, which is something that people here know a lot about, of course. And so you can see here, the, this graph is, a, is an extension of what Hubble saw in, in 1927. So Hubble only saw this little corner here of this diagram where, where, where he, he, he put that line through his dots. We have been now able to extend this diagram to much further distances, and that's a, a, a picture from the paper that I quoted at the beginning, the 1999 Permuter et al. paper that was rewarded with the Nobel Prize for Physics. Uh, a few years ago, and this was the status in 1999 and 2010. You can see how many more data points we have, and how this 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 expansion of the universe is being charted out with greater and greater precision. Here are observations of the relic radiation from the Big Bang, the relic, the remnants of the of the of the Big Bang. 1994, the discovery of the microwave echo of the Big Bang with a COBE satellite, again, Nobel Prize for Physics. 2001, the WMAP satellite measures the same, the same radiation, but with a much higher resolution. And now the Planck satellite, the latest instrument, has observed the sky with even greater resolution. You can see how, much, how many more details we can see from this light that comes straight from the Big Bang. Here, galaxies in the sky. In 1985, that was the state of the art. 1,100 galaxies observed. Each one of those dots is a galaxy on the sky. And this is the state of the art today. One million galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Each one of those colored dots is a, is a galaxy. And when the square kilometer array comes online in about 10 years' time, which will be a, a, a an array of radio telescopes spread over two continents, we will measure the position and, 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 and distance of tens of billions of galaxies in the sky. So this is what big data now means in, in, in our field. And what have we learned? So let's have a look at a patch of the sky. Let's have a look at, 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 at the patch of the sky, which is pictured here. So you can see here there's the full moon. The full moon is about half a degree on the sky, if you look at it. Um, from, from here, and everybody knows what the full moon, full moon looks like on the sky. And here is a little patch of that same sky, which is singled out by this uh, yellow uh, square. Okay, so this is a tiny little patch of the sky. To give you an idea of how, how small this yellow square is, uh, it is the same amount of sky that would fit inside the eye of a needle held at arm's length. So it's tiny. And yet, if you look at it with the most powerful, one of the most powerful telescopes that we have, the Hubble Space Telescope, this is what you see. There are 505,000 galaxies inside that eye of a needle. And each one of those galaxies contains about 100 billion stars, just like the Milky Way, our galaxy, contains about a few hundred billion stars. And if I zoom in, you can see that each one of those dots indeed is a galaxy. Since you can see beautiful spiral galaxies, and you can see uh, other more irregularly shaped galaxies, and so on and so forth. And so all of those galaxies, they fit within this eye of a needle. So you can imagine how many more there are in the entire universe as we cover the entire sky. And yet, perhaps the most astonishing discovery of modern cosmology is that this is only a fraction of what is out there. So the headline news is that 96% of the universe is actually missing. And so, what is this dark side of the universe? What is all the, all the rest that's out there that does not show up in that picture, and it doesn't show up in any of the picture? Well, we now know that the luminous matter stars and luminous gas is this tiny little sliver of the cosmic pie, this tiny little bit here. All the rest here, the, the red bit here, is all the non-luminous component in the form of intergalactic gas and neutrinos and supermassive black holes and so on, which is all stuff that's made of particles that are the same kind of particles that we are made of. So this part here is the tiny fraction of the universe that we know about. But the largest majority of the universe is made of dark, invisible, unknown, un yet, as of yet undiscovered stuff. Dark matter, 23% or so of the universe, and dark energy the uh, biggest part of the, of the pie, what in the book is called the dark push. And so one of the biggest mysteries of cosmology is precisely to try and work out what this 96, 95% of the universe is made of and what is the fundamental nature of all this stuff that we don't know about. But fortunately, we now have means of doing that with, uh, with data, with very sophisticated observations. Remember, cosmology is a time machine. In other words, the, the speed of light is finite. And being finite, it means that the further out you look in the universe, the further back in time you see, because light takes time to travel from the furthest objects to us. 300,000 kilometers per second is the speed of light. So every time you look at the sun, you're looking at the sun not as it is now, but you're looking at the sun as it was eight minutes ago. 
because that's how long it takes for light to cover the 150 million kilometers between us and the sun. So if you look at distant galaxies, you see them not as they are now, quote unquote, but as they were billions of years ago when that light first left. And so if you look back if further out in space, um, if we use the Hubble Space Telescope, that's pretty much how far back in space and time we can look, a few billion years ago. But if you use different types of light, like microwave light and microwave satellites, we can go back all the way almost to the Big Bang. And so we can pick up light that left just 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is the end of the visible universe. And this is what we see. So this is a picture of the sky taken in microwaves, and that's a picture that shows the baby universe. This light left when the universe was a tiny, tiny fraction of its current age. The current age of the universe is about 13.7 billion years. And this light has been en route ever since, almost this, since the very beginning. And what you see here is a picture of the universe where there are no galaxies yet, because there was no time for galaxies to form. There are no stars yet. All there is is matter, light, photons, and dark matter. What you see here are the red spots are spots of slightly larger concentration of energy and light and matter, which are the seeds of uh, what, what then will become galaxies, such as the Milky Way. And so this picture here is the end of the visible universe. And I don't mean it as a metaphor. I mean it as a scientific statement, because there is no way we can see past this picture. The universe was. Uh, was uh, opaque to light before this time because it was too energetic for light to travel freely. Light kept bouncing off electrons and, and protons in the early universe. And so this early universe picture, which we can see, it can be described as a sort of fog. It was a high energy fog, 3,000 Kelvin temperature, so almost 3,000 degrees uh, uh, Celsius. Uh, but in the book, of course, I couldn't talk about it in terms of fog because there is no fog. In the list, in the, word, in the in the in the list of words. So here is how this early universe picture is described using uh, the thousand words. It was like when you look out your window on a cold morning. There is ice on the road, and everything looks grey, and you can't see past your driveway. This is because light gets kicked about by tiny water drops in the air before reaching your eyes. Something like this was happening at that time. That's to say, at the very beginning. Only everything was 100 times hotter than on a hot summer's day. And so this is just a simple description of what the universe looked like at the very beginning. And then things started to change and evolve, and galaxies grew out of it. And gravity started doing its job. And, the, and gravity, as I, saw, I told you before, is not at all a force. It's just a, a reflection of the shape of space-time. So here is how this can be described using the thousand word uh, lexicon. Just a, this is a crash course in general relativity in one paragraph and less than a thousand words in English. So I'm um, talking about uh, Einstein here and how he thought uh, gravity was different from Newton's gravity. He, that's to say Mr. Einstein, then asked himself what would happen if you put some heavy stuff, as heavy as a star, in the middle of space-time. He was the first to understand that matter pulls in space-time and changes the way it looks. In turn, the form of space-time is what moves matter one way or another. As an idea, this was very different from what Mr. Newton had said a long time ago. For Mr. Newton, space and time did not talk to each other, never married, and lived different lives. And then he goes on describing how this idea could be tested using a solar eclipse, because of course exceptional claims need exceptional means of evidence. And so in 1919, Einstein's idea of generative was proved, proven right by observations of a solar eclipse here. In, a, in, in one of the illustrations of the book that actually proved that light was being moved around and, 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 and changed the trajectory along the bent uh, space-time exactly like Einstein predicted. So here is uh, the backdrop of, the, uh, of what our student person is trying to do in, uh, in, uh, in, with our observations. And uh, all of these observations that I told you about, they paint a very strange picture of the universe, a picture of the universe where, well, we, again, we have a very puzzling universe, a universe where we have dark matter, again, these omega numbers that make, they make it look as if we know what we're talking about, but in reality, we just hide our ignorance behind Greek letters. And so the amount of, of dark matter that there is in the universe is, has been now measured very precisely using its gravitational effect in the cosmos, about 26.6% with a, a few percent error. 
around it. And then there is another, and possibly a new type of particle beyond the standard model of particle physics. And then there is dark energy, the dark push, the mysterious force that's making the universe expand faster with, and faster all the time, which, is, which, which makes up 70%, almost 68.6% .6 of the universe. And those two things together are very much mysterious. We don't know what they are. One, things we, one thing we've learned, actually, very precisely, which is the age of the universe. Now, the age of the universe is 13 billion 798 million years, which is astonishing you know, to be able to quote this figure with an margin of error of 37 million years only. That's nothing at all. I mean, we sit on the Earth, it's right here, and yet we don't know the age of the Earth to that precision. And we, know, we can tell the age of the universe with, with incredible accuracy. It's an accuracy that's really astonishing. Let's put this into, into perspective with a thousand words. This is really great if you think how long ago the big flash happened. It was over 100 times, 100 times, 100 times, 100 times, 100 years ago. We know the age of the older is so well that it would be like being able to tell the day of the year a stranger in the street came to life to the nearest day just by looking at him. And that's one of the great discoveries of cosmology that comes out of mapping out the tiny ripples in the microwave radiation in the, in the, in the luminous echo of the Big Bang that I was talking about before. And I don't want to go through the details of, of the technicalities, but I do want to show you one picture that's quite astonishing, I think. It's slightly technical, but again, I think people here will appreciate the idea of data compression and how we can compress a large amount of data into just a few numbers. So here we have our microwave satellite sending down a, a stream of data, a stream of points, 10 to the 12 bits of data that go into making this map of the sky that I told you before, 50 million pixels, that then gets reduced via statistical massaging into a, a plot which has got 2,500 measurements points on it. And this plot shows how much fluctuations there are on this map as a function of scale. It doesn't really matter the technical details, but what I want to show you is this plot, which is derived from the microwave background map, the, the, the map of the light from the Big Bang. And you can see the data points here which are in red. And they follow a very interesting oscillatory wave-like pattern, a pattern that we can understand using undergraduate level physics in very great detail, because this is physics of the early universe, which we understand with very uh, high precision. And this is proven by the fact that we can write down a theoretical model, a theory of the universe, of the older is, that contains three different ingredients. One is Einstein general relativity, the other one is the Big Bang as a theory, and the other one is this dark components, dark matter, dark energy, or the dark push, as I, as I put it. And you can see that this theoretical model, which has got only six numbers in it, six free parameters, is the, is the green line. It goes through the observations almost perfectly. So we understand this observation incredibly well, all the way, if we extend the horizontal axis, we understand them all the way to the smallest details down here, down into the into this uh, uh, tail of distribution. And so all I want to say with this is that we have this incredible wealth of data in the, about the universe. We've got these incredible, incredibly sophisticated models, and yet to make them work, to make the models uh, match the data, we need these two unknown ingredients. We need dark matter, we need dark energy, and we don't know what they are. And, they, and this is one of the biggest quests at the moment. So how does our student person go about understanding dark matter and dark energy. Um, so during her night of observations, she is uh, thinking at those, about those mysteries and how they are very much unsolved and what we can do to try and understand them better. So when she casts her mind's eye back to the dark push, this is what uh, goes on in her mind. She steps outside in the cold night, holding her cup of hot coffee with both hands. The wide road is beautiful in the dark, clear sky, and once again, she can't help but be amazed by it all. It does not matter how many times she has seen this before, or how much she knows about what is out there. The sight of the stars is enough to make her gasp. It all seems so still, and yet it's changing, with, uh, it's changing all the time, she whispers to no one. It is hard to believe that everything out there past the white road and its stars is running away from us. Yet, like Mr. Hubble found long ago, the star crowds are running away from each other as the space between them gets bigger and bigger. The older is, is growing with time. And that's 
what the dark push, what dark energy is doing, a repulsive force, possibly a new type of a vacuum energy, an energy associated with empty space itself that's pushing things apart. And the big mystery is that this dark energy not only is something that we don't understand fundamentally, it's something that could even be pointing to um, what I call the dark side of the universe here. Because one of the ideas to explain the existence of this dark push is to postulate the existence of a multiverse, a grander scheme of reality and in which we are but only but a tiny little bit of what is out there. So the all there is, all the stuff that I told you about, and this is very speculative, but it's just one of the ideas that can be invoked to explain the origin of the dark push of dark energy. So the idea is that all there is is only a tiny fraction of what reality is actually made of, that our uh, universe itself, presumably of infinite spatial extent, is but a tiny bit of a grander reality called the multiverse, which is depicted here by these different bubbles. And these different bubbles represent different uh, corners of the multiverse, each one of them with different laws of physics. And with those laws of physics varying across the multiverse, they could explain why our universe appears to be so strange with a, with a dark push, with a, with a dark energy content that, that appears to be strangely fine-tuned for life to be able to exist in our universe. And so this is what is called the anthropic principle, the idea that we live in a corner of the multiverse that's good for life, not because our universe is strangely fine-tuned, but because we as a biological life forms that need a, a long-lived cold universe with a, with a stable rock planet going around, rocky planet going around a star, we must be in a corner of the multiverse where the fundamental constants of nature are such that they will allow this kind of ecosystem to emerge. And so if we had a larger reality like the multiverse with a large number of possible uh, universes to try, life will only be found in the corner of the multiverse that's just right and, and therefore that would appear fine-tuned to us. So here is the idea of the multiverse, a collection of perhaps up to 10 to the 500 parallel universes, which is this spectacularly large number of parallel universes, each one of them with different laws of physics and different, and different um, ways of mixing the constants of nature. And we will be found in one special place, a place where everything is just right for us to exist, uh, or not us as human beings, but as uh, examples of biological life forms that need very special conditions. And so these are all, all ideas that go on in the, in the mind of our, of our heroine, the student woman, that at the end of her night is quite happy with the way her observations have gone. She has looked, uh, with the help of Big Seer, she has looked as far away as she possibly could, and she has uh, gathered a lot of data about uh, dark matter that she hopes to be able to uh, decrypt and understand in, in order to crack this mystery. So this is how her night ends, and this is how this talk ends. She sits down. The big blue body of water in front of her seems to go on without edges and without end. She can feel the warm hand of the sun on her face. She feels happy. The night's work has gone well. Big Seer has done a great job, the best that could be done. She can go home now. But her job has only just begun. There is much more left to do in the coming weeks and months before she can make sense of what Big Seer saw last night. She's looking forward to it. Letters and words and entire books are hidden in what Big Seer has given her, written in the strange tongue of the old there is. Little by little, she will understand it better and better. All she needs to do is ask the right questions in the right way, and she might learn the truth. She smiles, and the sun smiles back at her. So thank you very much for having me here today. It's been a great pleasure, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I was kind of surprised to see that matter was one of the thousand words, but things like fog was not. And so I wondered, maybe it might be a, a case of a, just a simple homonym, where it's matter as in you know subject or, or something like that. So do you think that? Uh, the presence of, I don't know, maybe matter is the only one, but do you think that, that having a, a homonym that you're using for a more abstract concept when in the thousand most likely, it's probably not used in that case, do you think that that uh, works against the, uh, the, the general concept of, of speaking simply like that? The, the question, yeah, I think that's, that's a very good question. The, the more general question is, what, where, where does the list of words come from and which list should one use, right? So I started using the same list that have been used for the AppGoer file just because it started as an experimental project very much. Um, and then later on when it became 
a book and it became something of, 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 of more substance, at least to me, I started asking myself those very same questions. Where do those words come from and what happens if I use a different list and which tools should I use to compile this list in the first place? And certainly, uh, to a certain level, which kind of source you use to compile the list will influence which words make it into the top thousand and which don't, and therefore this might give you more abstract or less abstract words to play with. And so to an extent, yes, uh, this is a relevant question to ask, but in the end I came around the, uh, um, the view that it, to, in, in a sense it doesn't really matter which words are on the list. A any rules, any set of rules is arbitrary to an extent and so, so are mine. So I wasn't that much interested in getting the absolute top thousand most used words in a specific context. What, what I was interested in was given a set of thousand words and a set of somewhat arbitrary rules, for example, I'm allowing myself to use names of people but not names of cities, just because I thought that names of people would be hard to go around and, and, and it, wouldn't, it would be a pointless exercise of style doing so. But names of city could be a fun thing to work with if you don't have them. And so given that set of rules, I was interested in seeing what kind of voice, what kind of different approach to thinking about those concepts emerged. And so, yes, possibly you know, a different list would make the, the exercise harder or easier, perhaps. Uh, but the point is that any list will have words that are missing from it. And so the question is, how do you get around it and what kind of different approach? My hope is that uh, the voice that emerges from the exercise will be novel and surprising and new and refreshing, even, even if, so, if some words are, that, that are missing should be there, perhaps, or shouldn't be there. Uh, my point is just to, to, to take a new approach to this subject and, and see whether or not this can speak to people and what people can take away from it. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So you explain why you're using the thousand words as opposed to another number. Uh, but once you've finished all this, do you think that maybe if you had like 10,000, you'd have been able to do uh, a better job not getting too far away from your message without using words that people would not understand necessarily? Right. I, I found actually that thousand words was a very interesting sweet spot because I looked at the list and the list goes up to 2,000 words, so I don't know about 10,000 words, I haven't. But even if you, even if you go to 2,000 words, there's lo th that list is, is, quite, is quite comprehensive, in fact. Lots of words that I couldn't use are in the 2,000 words, uh, like energy, for example, and, 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 and force is in the, in the top 2,000 and so on. And so 2,000 words is almost too long a list because it doesn't impose enough of a straitjacket on your expression, I think. If you make it too easy for yourself, then the experimental side of it, the, the, the language, playfulness is lost in a sense because you, you got almost all the words you'd wish for except perhaps for redshift or technical words that you don't want to use because they're jargony and, and that's fine. But 2,000 words would be already too big, I think, at least to, to impose any meaningful restrictions on your way of expressing yourself. On the other hand, 500 words would be too few and it, you couldn't make it work, I don't think, with 500 because it's uh, it becomes too hard and you really, it becomes really, really cumbersome to say almost anything with only 500. So a thousand words is actually a nice sweet spot and, and, uh, and it worked. It was hard, hard enough, but not impossible. And I, I, I think if you, if you tweak it either side, you might find that it becomes either too easy, in which case you fall back to a standard way of expressing almost those concepts, or too hard, in which case it becomes more of an exercise in style, which this one is only to a certain extent. The, the purpose of this is not to be an exercise in style, it's to really talk about things in a way that people will understand. And I hope, you know, this, this is my hope, then it's up to my readers to see whether I've succeeded or not. And that's why I'm also very keen to hear from people what they think, whether it works for them or not. So that's, that's very much an experiment on my side. Well, so we all know the universe is expanding. Uh, the part I wasn't too clear about is whether, I've read in some places that the medium that the universe is in could actually be expanding in addition to the galaxies moving from one another, which means that they could move faster than the speed of light, since whatever they're sitting on is actually moving or stretching at the same time. Okay. Uh, can you explain a bit more about that? So, there, there's lots of confusion about this, this barrier of the speed of light. You know, some people, people mistakenly think that um, because, as we know, the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit, galaxies cannot move away from each other faster than the speed of light. That is plain wrong. Right. Okay? Galaxies do move 
uh, faster away from each other than the speed of light, and they do so routinely. In fact, there is a large number of the galaxies that we saw on that sl slide that are moving away from us at faster than the speed of light and always have been. Now, that's a tricky bit because you think, well, actually, if those galaxies are moving away faster than the speed of light, how is it that we can see them? How is it that light can catch up with us in the first place? So that's something that's slightly counterintuitive about it and cannot be explained except with general relativity. So the, you know, analogies su such as you know, if you go downstream and the stream is faster than you can, you can, you can swim up, up or upstream, you will never catch up uh, in, in the place you started. Those kind of analogies do not work in cosmology because of general relativity. So galaxies do move away faster than the speed of light, but the point is that it's not them moving in space faster than the speed of light, it is space between them that's expanding faster than the speed of light. And so that doesn't break the speed of light barrier because the speed of light barrier is for objects inside space-time to, to have so-called peculiar velocities, as I say, velocities in, inside space-time moving from one place to another. But because space-time itself, the pizza dough, if you like, in the, in the analogy, is expanding, the, the, the recession speed, the speed at which things which are bolted on to space-time are moving away from each other can be faster than the speed of light. And so, and so that, is, that is a misconception that things cannot move farther away than the speed of light. They do, and we observe them all the time. And now, every time I see the W map uh, picture, I'm trying to understand why does it have its shape and what does it really represent? Does it represent anything that's moving away from us? Since obviously things coming with us would be able to see the one closer to us as opposed to seeing it how it was 13 million years ago. Um, you mean the, the microwave background picture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So microwave back background picture, this picture here, is actually a, think of this as a picture taken on a screen, okay? So this, this picture here is, all, all the light that comes from this picture has been emitted 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and it has been traveling ever since through, through the universe. So um, this is like a, a snapshot, literally, it's a snapshot of what the universe looked like at that time. So by shape, do you mean the, the shape of the, of the picture itself or the shape of the, of the blobs inside? No, the shape of the picture and the thing is, mm -hmm. for, it, for us to see 13 billion years in the past, we have to be 30 billion light years away from it or not? That's right, that's absolutely, problem. yeah, even more, I mean, because of course, 13 billion light years is a, is a travel time, but in, in the meantime, in this time, the, the, the part of space from which this light has left has been expanded away. So the current distance right. to this part is much more, it's about 45 billion light years, in fact. Right. So right. Is, is all of that stuff that's moving away from us today? Or some of it actually is moving our direction? No, so all of this will, will be moving away because it's so f far right. away that, that it, it will be moving away. But that's why we're seeing it now, otherwise we wouldn't be seeing it that far in the past. Well, we, we would, you know, we, you, would see, you would see those things now, after the light travel time, independently of whether they're moving away or moving uh, uh, towards us, just because of the, 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 the initial distance between them and us, and then the light beam leaves, and then it travels through space time, and whatever the initial source is doing is, is then independent, right? So it's just the time that it takes to light to travel across the space time. And so that's, 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 how, that's how this con the connection between us and this distant uh, part of space is purely given by the light travel time that it takes to a beam of light to go from there to now. Oh, so something that could emit light back then, because you just said can move faster than the speed of light because of the medium. That well, that's right, it, it will be moving, it will be, right? It will be recessed away from us faster than the speed of light in the right. meantime, but the light in, in this, uh, uh, all the while is catching up with us, so we will see the picture of, it, of that object as it was at the moment when the light had been emitted. Okay, mm -hmm. and then the reason for that actual shape, mm -hmm. Why does the shape really? Okay, the shape, shape is just the fact that we're looking at the entire sky all around us, and so sometimes you will see this shape in the shape of a balloon, which will be the shape of the sky, like what, like when you have a a, a, a a normal constellation type of balloon with all the constellations painted on it. And then what you do, you cut this balloon across one of the great circles, and you lie down flat, and this is what you see. Okay. So it's just a picture of the entire 360 degrees sphere of the sky around us, cut along one of the great circles, and lie down flat on paper. So where That's would the Earth be on that picture? Like at the, the, at the center. Okay. At the it center. It's middle. all around. It's wrapped around that us. That is how it's, it's put on the picture. Okay, yeah. Got it. yeah, yeah. That's right. Let's thank Robert again. Thank you. Thank you.